Nehemiah chapter 6. Verse number 1, the Bible says this. It says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Brother Tyler, children, will you pray for us? And then everybody can be seated and we'll get started. Amen. Everybody can be seated. So what we just read is kind of the climax of a situation going on with Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, uh, at the beginning of the book, you see he's got a burden to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, the city of God, it, it's been burned down with fire. And so he wants to go back and fix it, make things right. And after he makes that decision to go back and to build the walls, if you remember the book, all the way through, he just gets opposition. People just giving him a hard time. He's got obstacles he's got to overcome to go back and to build the wall. But then the people you read about, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, their attitude has been toward Nehemiah very um, antagonistic. They've been mean. They've been cruel. They've mocked him. But now all of a sudden, if you notice again in verse 1, it says, that our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein. And so all of the wall up until this point, it wasn't just a fourth done or halfway done, it's finished. All the walls are up and their tone changes. And now all of a sudden they wanted Nehemiah uh, to come down and to meet with them. They're like, look, let's make some type of compromise here. Surely we can come to some type of agreement. You can calm down a little bit. We don't have to be enemies anymore. We can fix it. And maybe we can come to some terms of agreement. And Nehemiah's answer to him is said, look, I'm doing a great work that I cannot come down. I cannot come down. And what I want to preach to you this morning is I'm not coming down. And as Christians and as this church, I'm telling you, the world will try to pull us down from this great work that we're doing. This great work for Jesus Christ that we got going, there will be distractions and different types of obstacles try to say, look, will you just come down, maybe tone it down a little bit, maybe we can... Uh, work together and see something, all the things we have in common, and everybody could just get on the same page, and our answer to them is the same one Nehemiah gave. Listen, we are not coming down. We ain't coming down off of it. And you know, I, I, throughout this story, he calls it a great work, and obviously this is something that lasts on for generations and generations, this temple that he goes and rebuilds. Now people have a place to come worship. People have a place to come and hear, hear the word of God and to be close to God, and it's all thanks to somebody going back and doing that great work. And when you think about Nehemiah, that's what you think about is him going back and rebuilding the wall. And I was thinking about other men throughout the Bible that we remember for basically just one great work. You know, if I was to say the name Noah, not this Noah, okay, not the one doing the children's office, Noah from the Bible, what do you think? You think about that big old ark that he built. Him and his sons built that ark. God promised that there was going to be rain. And uh, he's preaching and telling them that the rain's going to come. And he builds that ark. And I'm certain... I'm certain whenever he preached that message and said, look, it's going to be bad. God's going to destroy the whole world. People said, no, no, he's not. I'm not worried about it. And you can tell that by the fact that nobody else gets on the ark except him and his family. Yet he stays building it, nail after nail, board after board, until the ark is finished and he gets on it. And the Bible says the Lord shut the door and shut him in. And I'm certain as the water rose, according to statistics, if the rain was gradual, it was going over 30 feet an hour the water was rising. And don't you know after about two, three, four, five, six feet going up, all those people started saying, Noah, Noah. And he's like, I ain't coming down. I ain't coming down. It's too late. You had your chance. I think about Moses. You know, Moses, he comes and God's asked me, he says, you go tell Pharaoh 
the person who's in charge of all the nation of Israel, he's got them enslaved. You tell them, let my people go. And he sends back and forth on him, and you know the story. And Pharaoh starts trying to make little deals with him. He says, okay, look, I'll let you go sacrifice, but don't go very far, and only certain of you go. And Moses keeps going back and goes, no, no. He said, let my people go, every one of them. And then by the end of it, Moses doesn't back down. He doesn't compromise, and every single Jew in the nation of Egypt goes out through the Red Sea and survives. And all the Egyptians that stay don't. And all the ones that come after him, Moses made up his mind. He said, look, you trying to make an agreement with me? No. God said all the people's going, and they all left. You know, I think about David. David and Goliath, they have this kind of uh, deal going on in the, in the valley. And Goliath says, here's the deal. If you beat me, we'll serve you. If I beat you, you serve us. And David said, no, I'm not worried about any of that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kill you. I'm going to go kill all of the Philistines. I'm going to give you to the fowls of the air to eat. And we're not making no deals. Nobody's getting serving nobody. Everybody's going to die. And David doesn't come down. He doesn't come down. He stays true to it. I think about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they're in a situation where Nebuchadnezzar puts up this really big image and he plays music. And the only rule is, look, you can do whatever you want to at any other time. But when I play this music, I want you to bow. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no, look, I'm not bowing. And then they come before King Nebuchadnezzar and he's, he's trying to ridicule them, trying to pressure them into making a decision. And they say, look, we're not careful to answer thee. Uh, you play that music, you set the image up, I'm not bowing, I'm not doing any of it, you can put us in the fire, God can deliver us, he may not, I don't care, I'm not bowing. And we remember those men, not for their personality, not for how many friends they had, not for how smart they were, but for that great work that they're associated with that they did. When I say, the, when I say these names, you know this person did such and such. And so when your name is going to come up after they record you in an obituary one day, and we're going to walk by your tomb. We're going to come by the casket here at the church and say, man, this person did what? What great work will you be associated with? You know, people on their tombstone, they have to get real clever and cute and try to do something to be remembered by. And you know, and you got your high school quote, you're trying to do something funny. So say, ha ha, that's real funny or whatever. Or this person's most likely to succeed, most likely to get beat up, <laughs> you know, most likely to work it. Never mind. But... All these different things that these people, they try to just to get remembered. Where if you just do one big great work for God, people would remember you. You wouldn't have to worry so much about reputation and popularity and what other people thought. You wouldn't have to worry about it if you just do something for God. And I think about even in a worldly sense, if I say some names, you'll know who I'm talking about and what they did. If I say the name Babe Ruth, everybody in here knows he played baseball. Some kids still think he's the greatest baseball player that ever lived. I mean, he ain't. <laughs> But people think that. They know him for calling his shot, and then that person pitched the ball, and then he hit it right where he called the shot. They, people know Babe Ruth for that. Here's another one, Michael Jordan. Even in a worldly sense, I'll say Michael Jordan, you know you think basketball. And it's, it's debated. Think about this now. He, he's still alive. There's a man who they think is alive right now who is the greatest basketball player to ever play. Now, look, the debate's on the side. I don't care one way or the other, okay? If you're interested in debating, I'm not the guy. To, I don't care about Michael Jordan for a second, all right? As far as I'm aware, he's a sinner just like us, and he needs to get saved. And if he doesn't get saved, he's going to go to hell forever. And God loved him and died for him. That's what I care about Michael Jordan. But in a worldly sense, people know him from basketball, one of the greatest players to ever live. How about this? If I say this name, Tiger Woods, everybody in here knows Tiger Woods. He was a great hockey player. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Only hockey player I know is Wayne Gretzky. Anybody know him? Not many. Okay, so Tiger Woods, he played golf. And you know, one, th one thing he did too is he revolutionized the game, not just because, uh, and I learned this from my boss mainly, he's one of the Tiger Woods experts, would you say? You know, up and coming expert? Yeah, <laughs> and so... They would have to lengthen the courses because he drove so far. I mean, that's crazy. And also in a time where it was a, primarily the sport was majority white people, you know, that played. And then he'd come and just took it by storm. Imagine that. We found out that something else that a black person is better than us at, you know, another sport. I mean, I think we had baseball at a time. We lost that. You know, we had football for a time. We lost that. And we had, no, I don't know if we ever had basketball. Probably not. <laughs> no. But one thing we could count on was this old white man to hold the fort when it comes to golf, and now that's long gone, okay? I think what we're finding out, the general consensus is, look, we're just not as good as we think we are. Somebody else is better. 
But I say those names and you know, you know who I'm talking about. You know the situation. You know what they did and what they're associated with in the world or in the church. And so the questions we've got to ask is, what, what does it take for somebody to do this great work to be remembered by? How do I come upon some great work that God wants me to do? How do I know what it is he wants me to do? What can I expect when it happens? And what will it look like when I'm finished? When I'm finished. i got three things to say about this great work. If you would, turn back to chapter 1 of Nehemiah. First thing we're going to look at is the cause of this great work. The cause. It's a lot simpler than you think to do a great work for God. It really is. But the reason a lot of people don't do it is because it really just involves you and God. And people are not content to just have them and God. They have to have some other person and some other thing. And you're going to see this right here with Nehemiah. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now what you just read, I'm going to tell you some of the first things you want to do uh, a great work for God, you see one thing in, in verses 1 and 2, you see interest. All of a sudden he's in a situation, he starts asking about God's place and God's people. And what we see is the first thing, if you want to start doing God's work, you want to do a great work for God, you got to get interested in God's place and God's people. Yeah. Nobody goes and does a great work for God out there um, in society or in the financial industry. God's not interested in those great works. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He doesn't need any more money. He doesn't need any more fame or popularity. He's interested in God's people, the people he died for. That's the ones he's interested in. And so Nehemiah, all of a sudden, he, he says, you know what? Uh, how's Jerusalem doing? How is God's people doing? And then in verse 3, he gets this answer. He goes, the people are in great affliction. The walls are torn down and the cities are burned with fire. And in verse 4, you don't hear him say, well, man, that's tough, man. I'm going to pray for you. That's, that's bad. No, it says he sat down and he wept certain days and mourned and fasted and prayed. He was burdened. So we have an interest and then we have a burden. You know, the reason a lot of people aren't tore up when they come to church is because their interest and their attention is all in the world throughout the week. And then on Sunday, you have to try to work up some type of burden. And you remember what it was like when you were really invested in church and you used to cry in church and songs meant something to you. And it was special coming in this place because you used to be out in the world and now your mind's just out there the whole time. And you'll never get your burden where your interest isn't. And your interest would be what you're excited about. I mean, think about this. You know, uh, I talk about, uh, I don't really care to debate about Michael Jordan. I used to be a, a huge sports guy, you know. And then once I got saved, I'm not saying I don't like sports. I mean, I still play on the softball team. I like it. But that stuff doesn't have the same uh, draw to me as it used to. And so I don't really know about these people who are saved and saved for a long time. They're still just excited about playing sports as they are reading the Bible or praying or church. I don't know about people like that. I really don't. And my interest started to change, but I remember I went to a basketball game with Brother Mark. It was a high school basketball game. It was not my high school game. I, I, I don't care about high school basketball, but especially not if I don't even know who's playing or whatever. By the end of it, I'm sitting there watching, and I had to go get some popcorn. And I went and got a drink, and all of a sudden I'm in it, and I start seeing the way this guy's playing. I like the way he's playing. You know, he's playing aggressive. He's good on defense. I like that. This other guy's Crying and pouting every time he gets fouled. I'm like, I don't really like that guy. I don't even know him, but I got people I like and don't like now. I'm like, man, number four, man, he's trash. I don't even like that guy. They didn't just give the 11 the ball. We'd, we'd done one by now. I'm talking about we would have done one by now. I didn't even go to this high school. I ain't even in high school. I'm talking about we. <laughs> and so as the game's going on, I'm starting noticing this ref does not call charges. He won't call charges whatsoever. And their team, one team's playing real passive, so they're never going to be in that situation. They just throw up threes and shoot bricks. And this other team's actually trying to take it to the lane, the team I'm watching, and they keep getting fouls called on them because they won't call the charge. And so I'm getting upset. And then by the end of it, I think it was halftime or something like that, uh, the team's you know, going to the locker room, the ref's coming by. And I stood up 
God's honest truth. I wish, I wish it wasn't. I stood up. I was probably about seven or eight rows up. And I looked real, real mad. And I pointed. I said, hey, boy. And this grown man looked up at me, this referee. And I said, quit chewing on that whistle and blow it. And I sat there for a second. I went, what am I doing? I sat down. And I felt so awkward. Of course, Mark's laughing the whole time. I'm not getting no grace over here. When I stood up, he should have told me to sit down, but he didn't. And so I stood up. There was probably a 55-year-old man I just yelled at and called him a boy because he, he won't call. But it's all of a sudden, when I hadn't been in that element and I come back to it, now my interest is there to where I care enough to stand up and yell at a grandfather who's just trying to do his job, make a little bit money, a little money on the side. And me and him done got contentious now about this game that doesn't matter. And let's just be honest. Some of you is the same way. Your interests... And you get burdened about stuff that does not matter. And you get all invested and emotional about stuff that God does not care about. And you'll be just like me, standing up yelling at somebody about something that it really does not matter. But Nehemiah gets burdened about God's people and he gets interested. And then what naturally flows out of that in verse 4 through 11 is prayer. Just him and God praying. A lot of people get upset and burdened and feel like they got to go do something right off the bat. No, no, the first thing you need to do is pray. And people say, man, I struggle praying. Well, look, let, uh, let me help you. You'll never have another excuse for not having a prayer life, okay? If you'll put your interests on the right things, it'll create the right burden, and you won't have to force yourself to pray. It'll just naturally happen. People set aside time to pray. Set aside time to think on the things of God, and then prayer will naturally flow out of it. I promise. Now, am I saying I'm great at praying? No, it's because I don't take the time to put my interests and burden on the right things. As I told you, I'm yelling at referees, okay? I'm still working on this too, all right? But that's what happens, and then... You see in chapter 2, notice this in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, It came to pass in the month forward, I mean Nisan, in the 20th year, I'm just seeing if everybody's paying attention, of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Notice this. The king doesn't get upset. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? So I pray to the God of heaven. And so Nehemiah is in a situation. Think about this. From the rest of that chapter, the king gives him all the resources, all the authority, all of the men that he needs to go back and to build the wall. And he's been working for this guy the whole time. But now all of a sudden when his interest goes to the right place and he gets the right burden and the right prayer, all of a sudden his mundane job that's just holding him back becomes the very thing that God uses to open up the door for him to go back and do a great work for God. People always think, well, if I had such and such, I could really do something for God. Or if I was in such and such church, or if I was over here at such and such place, or if I would have been born in the 1800s, or, man, I think that kind of stuff. If I was born when all those great revivals happened, I would have been a great revivalist. No, you wouldn't have. Probably not. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to when you get your heart and your mind on the right things, all of a sudden God can start working out opportunities. And then before you know it, Nehemiah's got everything he needs to go do that great work. So the first thing we see is the cause of the great work. It starts with you. If you get interested and burdened and prayerful about the right things, God can work out situations for you to do a great work. He's just waiting on you. You don't have to wait on him. He's very interested in in doing work. What's that verse say in the back? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. There's not many Nehemiahs. That's why when we hear about, uh, we hear Nehemiah prayer, that's right there in verse 4. We hear about Nehemiah building the walls. There should be more Nehemiahs, but there's not. And so the cause of the great work starts with you. Now come to chapter 2, verse 10. The second point, we're going to see the confrontation of a great work. The confrontation. Verse 10 says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And so what he finds out is now that he's wanting to do something for God, there's somebody that's upset about it, and I promise you that's still the way it is today. The devil is not interested in God's uh, kingdom, God's church, God's people advancing one step. He's upset all the time with God. Uh, 
nobody can stop him. He's the father of the children of pride. And you're not going to sway him. And he's going to wake up. I mean, he doesn't even have to wake up. When you wake up, he's ready and waiting on you and trying to set you up to fail. And so Nehemiah makes up his mind. He's going to go build this wall and he starts getting resistance. They mock him in chapter 3 and chapter 4. One of the things they insult him and say, man, if you build that wall, even a fox could go up and knock it down. I mean, just belittling him. And then at the end of chapter 4, they even threaten to fight. And they say, look, if you keep building, we're going to get all these different nations around us and we're coming and we're taking you out. All these threats that he's getting. And it'd be one thing if it was just the people on the outside, but even the people on the inside. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. These are some of the people that's repairing the wall. Verse 5, it says, Next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. That is, there were some people that were real important in the church. There were people that were real important Jews, real special Jews, people that just, I mean, I'm way too whatever to get involved in this work for God. Now, all these other regular people made up their mind that they were going to help Nehemiah and do this great work, but all those people that were a little too good for that particular work. Well, you know, I don't know, man. Vacation Bible School is kind of kiddie, you know. You know, Christmas program, I don't know. That's just kind of like what, it, you know, people act like that. Man, this is all a great work. If there's one thing here that you're just a little too noble for, a little too high for, then you're just not going to get involved in a great work. And that's between you and God. You're going to miss out on that great work. In chapter 4, you got some people who's scared. They're fearful. A bunch of Jews, they say, well, they said if we keep building, we're going to get in trouble with the king. They said if we keep building, somebody's going to get upset. They said if we keep building, there's going to be problems. Maybe it's going to cost money to keep building. Uh, yeah. But if God asks you to go build that wall, then what's it matter? If God asks you to do it, don't you think he can supply what you need? And that's something Nehemiah already learned. And so you notice he still has a little patience with them because they weren't there when Nehemiah was praying. They weren't there when the king told him. They weren't there and all those private things that Nehemiah did that gave him the confidence to go on and build the wall. they just been out there doing their own thing. And then all of a sudden somebody comes with a, a message from God to let's go build the wall and everybody's getting upset and fearful and scared and worried. It's because you ain't been doing the private things Nehemiah's doing. Could be the cause of it. Could be the cause of it. And so he's got all this opposition from the outside and from the inside for this great work. And let me tell you, that's exactly how it goes on today. Right now, there's this huge movement. I know you're aware of it. We joke about it. But honestly, they're trying to force the Christians to feel bad for anybody who's not a Christian. Think about this. This whole gay pride movement and all of this stuff to try to get you to feel bad for somebody who God said was an abomination... You know, there's one religion, there's one book primarily that is completely against homosexuality. You'll never guess which one it is. It happens to be the one they try to get to feel bad. They try to make us public enemy number one so that we'll stop and we'll come down a little bit. Well, look, we're not coming down. Look, I'm sorry, it, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, they don't know any better, they're raised in a home that promotes it, and we ought to have mercy and compassion. You don't know which one was which, so you ought to just give them the gospel and pray for them, but at the same time, look, it's wrong. You shouldn't do it. That kind of stuff, if we let that around our church and around our kids, it'll warp their mind. And they'll think it won't be that big of a deal. Listen to me. It's, it's a bad place when in a, a southern city like this, we can't even go down and get chicken strips without having to deal with a bunch of primped up faggots. And the reason you might be uncomfortable right now with that is because you don't got sympathetic for people that God's against. Do you know the Bible says God's angry with the wicked every day? And i got to tell you, look, I have to have compassion because I've never once had any type of desire or inclination to be with another man ever. But you ought to feel sorry for somebody who hasn't been taught that that's okay from a very young age. I remember one time I was watching Sports Center with my, with my dad. I was going back and I saw my family. And I was watching Sports Center and they had a 30 for 30 on there of a boy who turned into a girl and was on his middle school and high school track team as he was coming up. And his parents were all for it. You better thank God you weren't raised in a home like that to where now you hear about Christianity and their view of God is so messed up. That's the country that we live in. They're promoting that kind of stuff. Something else, you know, I've mentioned that we joke about this and, and people get real uncomfortable about it. And uh, I'm just unconcerned with it. This Black Lives Matter stuff. Let me explain something to you. We're not trying to get political here at Holy Hills Baptist Church, but that stuff is undergirded by communism and socialism and Marxism. They have no desire and no compassion for anybody that's actually an African American. Don't let them fool you on that. That stuff's wrong. That, that Bible right there doesn't have you being prejudiced against anybody. 
And if you're a racist, you're the one with problems. And that's, that's bad issues. That's a soul. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter. But at the same time, that's the opposition that we get from them, that I'm supposed to feel bad for somebody when I ain't never met a slave my entire life. I ain't never been a slave. None of my friends were slaves. I'm, I'm just for, feel bad for everybody that's ever had something bad happen to them. I can't bear the burdens of the whole world. Take that stuff to Jesus Christ and get it off social media. Amen. Black Lives Matter. And people try to get us all upset and nervous about, I mean, the coronavirus. They get us upset about this and feel bad. You know, like I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to feel bad for the fact that I'm going to make up my mind that I'm going to come to church. You might be a carrier for somebody who might be a carrier who might get somebody else sick. I remember when that first hit, I was working at UPS. I know you're tired of hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it too. But I was working at UPS, and I remember people freaked out because all these boxes were made in China. And some of the news that was coming out was this virus could survive on a box for three or four, three or four days now. I don't know who come up with that. And then it could travel all the way across the world on a ship which apparently takes less than three or four days, and then get there, get on the truck, unload it, down to me, and I have to wear these gloves and this mask or I might get it. And I remember I sat down and I thought about it for about 30 seconds to 60 seconds, God's honest truth, and I said, well, who's to say, if you can have it and not show any symptoms, that somebody at the glove factory and the mask factory had it and then put it on all the gloves and all the masks, and so the thing I put on to try to keep me safe actually has it, and then I get it from that. And I start going in this endless, r ridiculous cycle of, I don't know if I have it or not. Man, everybody's dead if everything they say about it's true. Everybody's in here got it and got it right now. But they get you all freaked out to where you can't come to church and do the things you know you're supposed to do because of all this theoretical science stuff. Amen. Apparently I'm hitting the nail on the head or something because I'm telling you, if you want to do a great work, you can't listen to every single thing that somebody says about why you can't come to church or why you can't live for God. You can't listen to it. And even within the church, we get that stuff outside, but within the church, I mean, the body of Christ is moving so bad that now we're putting women in the pulpit and queers in the pulpit, and we're supposed to just be okay with it and not say anything about it. All these people that stand up and say and try to claim that they get some type of visions in the night and they get some dream from God, when I just have to sit and rely on my old Bible, but he gets to see Jesus Christ at the foot of his bed. He gets to walk with him, and God gives him all this special stuff. Trying to just twist it to where all of a sudden I'm the bad guy because I say, hey, I think he just finished talking right here. He has spoken unto us in these last days by his son, Jesus Christ. And I've got his word right here and I can count on that. Peter says this is a more sure word of prophecy than all the experiences that he had. But oh, so-and-so can heal somebody. Well, look, the day I see somebody that's been in a wheelchair or a quadriplegic and they go touch them and raise them up, then I'll start paying a little attention to him, okay? Until then, I'm not worried about it. Until I see somebody, I'm not talking about the visually impaired and they're just struggling a little bit because they're sick and you go touch their head and they feel better and now they can see just, not, no. I want to see somebody who's actually blind. I want to see somebody dead, raised up from the ground and then we'll start paying attention to you and we'll give you some little homage and say, hey, yeah, he's a real good brother or sister in Christ. Instead, until you're just a liar, we found you out, you know, uh, all your teaching and stuff, you could actually heal somebody, you would have done it. You wouldn't have to have 15 to 20 weeks of Bible study on it. You walk in a hospital, raise somebody up on their sick bed one time, and that's all we would need. Amen. But we're supposed to just feel bad for them. There's these people who try to teach that if you don't get baptized, you can't get saved. Look, I understand they got their verses and their interpretation, but they're still wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. We're not coming down off the doctrine. The King James Bible is still the perfect, inerrant word of God. We're still going to believe salvation by grace through faith. Once saved, always saved. Eternal security. Jesus Christ is still God. He's, on, he's at the right hand of God the Father. He's coming back with or without anybody's acceptance or appreciation of it. We're not coming down off of it. We're not coming down. But we get all this conflict and all this stuff. Man, if you're going to do a great work, you've got to expect it. And lastly, as we begin to close, we see the completion of a great work. You do get conflict, but man, once you finish it, as you read the rest of the chapters, chapter 7 ends, there's some people getting promoted. There's some men that were faithful throughout that work, and they get a promotion. In chapter 8, you see some preaching. In chapter 9, you see God start pardoning people and forgiving them. Ain't that good, God forgiving you? And then you see some purging take place. That is, they start separating themselves from people they shouldn't be with, which is a good thing. The Bible says, be not deceived, man. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It's very important that we get around the right people at the right place doing the right thing. 
And I like it. At chapter 9 and chapter 10, they make this covenant. All of them that make it through the work and finish it. And they make this, this covenant that says, you know, we're going to worship God. We're going to live by him. We're not going to defile ourselves. And everybody comes by and they sign it. And they say, I'm in. I'm sealing myself unto it. I'm, I'm committing to not just do the great work. We've done it, but to maintain it. And what would be really good is if people would just say, you know what? I really do want to do a great work for God. So-and-so does. Sister does over here. Brother does over here. I say we just all make up our mind. We're going to do a great work. And we just sign to it and seal and say, look, at the revivals, I'll be there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, I'll be there. I'm going to sign on it. Wednesday night, you can, see, you can expect me here. On the job site, you can expect me living right. You know, whether you find me in public or in private, I'm making up my mind. I'm sealing to it. And you can count on me. I'll be there. That's the kind of stuff you see at the completion of the work. And, you know, we talk about this story and all the stuff that Nehemiah does. But does anybody, don't answer, but know how long this work actually took? According to the Bible, it says it took 52 days to finish this wall. You know, in your mind, you probably think years and years and years. But look, it's a lot shorter than you think. 52 days to do this great work. And Nehemiah lives in infamy now because people know about it. 52 days. And you know, that's a, that's a good symbol and a sign of on this earth, we have a temporary time, a short amount of time to do this great work for God. And all the Sundays and the Wednesdays and the revivals and all these opportunities that we have to come be a part of it, they eventually go away. They eventually pass. And just like 52 days, how it passes that quick, all of a sudden we'll be taking our last breath and all that will be left of whatever work that we've done or not done for God. All the work that we have done or not done for God. And I think about Paul the Apostle, whenever he's finished, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I kept the faith. And you want to be able to say that. You want to be able to die and go to heaven knowing that you've done a great work for God. And you know, I think about Jesus Christ. He said that he, he, uh, his father worketh hitherto and I work. He said, I come to do the work of him that sent me. And one time there were some people that he, he fed the 5,000. They come to him and they say, what, what can we do that we might work the works of God? What is it that I can do to where I can do some work for God too? And he said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. He said, God's work is that you're getting people that you believe on me and other people are believing on me. And if you want to do a great work for God, that's something that you could start, something you could do. Try to get other people believing on him. Try to get witnessing to people. Try to be in a place where he can count on you to be faithful. And I think about this, and, uh, and we'll close on this. Jesus Christ, he takes that cross all the way up to Golgotha, to the hill called Calvary. And he gets up there on that cross, and some of the people come by mocking him. And one of the things they said, he says, if you be the son of God, won't you come down off that cross? And he stays on the cross until the work's finished. You know, Nehemiah eventually did come down from the wall. Nehemiah did stop. He stopped building, he put the hammer down, but it wasn't until the work was done. And Jesus Christ on that cross, they tell him to come down. He doesn't come down until he says, it is finished. It is finished. Until it's finished, man, the work's not done. The work's not done. We've got to get involved in it. We've got to do this great work. I've told you about the cause. I've told you about the conflict. And I've told you about the completion. And I'm telling you, there's no peace. There's no peace like laying down going to sleep knowing I did what God asked me to do. There's no peace like it. And whenever you lay down for the last time, getting ready to wake up in eternity, you want to be able to look back on a life that did great works for God. And you can do it, but it's going to start with you. It's going to start with you.